Good morning once again. <clears throat> As uh, Cassie said, I am Bill Sanders. I'm a retired pastor in Denver Presbytery and delighted to be with you. It is always good to worship together in the house of the Lord. I also bring you greetings from the Presbytery's Ministry Relations Committee on which I serve. Uh, you are regularly in our prayers and occasionally we come and try to help out and not get in your way. Um, but we bring greetings to you from the Presbytery. It is a delight to be with you and for those of you that are worshiping with us online, uh, it's, it's good to have you along as well. Let us worship God as we sing. I invite you to stand if you are able as we sing our first hymn, Our God, Our Help in Ages Past. join me in our call to worship this morning. We are gathered to give witness to the endurance realities of life. We have come to affirm that life is a gift, and that the gift is good, and that it comes from God. We are gathered to renew our hope in Jesus Christ as we travel life's long journey. We find God in the past of our present and our past. But we also trust in God's love in our future. The same God glides us all the way, every day of our lives and beyond life. Let us praise God with our whole hearts and entrust our lives to God's hands. Amen.
It is in humble anticipation we come before God to confess our sins, both individually and as a community of faith, knowing that God awaits our reconciliation. Let us pray together the prayer of confession. O oh God, God of love, God of power, God of power we, we have heard your promises of abundant life and have been afraid to believe them. We have worshipped you with our lips, but have reserved parts of ourselves for our own purposes and plans. We are bound by our need for absolute certainty, and so we often miss your living presence in the surprises of life. Renew us by turning our trust to you again, we pray. Friends, there is no greater joy in the heart of God than the moment when a daughter or son opens to the gift of forgiveness. God's Spirit reaches out to assure us of welcome in Christ. In the, in the name, name of Jesus Christ, Christ we, we are God's by grace. With great joy, we are made alive. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. reconciled, forgiven people of God, and Jesus Christ offers to us a peace, a peace the world doesn't understand, a peace that is amazing and fulfilling even in times of chaos. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. I invite you to share a sign of Christ's peace with those around you. Hello. So our choir is not singing this morning because our pianist is out with COVID. So we, we are not going to have the choir singing First Fruits. We didn't find this out soon enough to be able to edit our bulletin. Um, so I am sorry you guys do not get the joy of the choir today, but instead you get me for extra time. <laughs> Thank you, that was the appropriate response. Um, this is the moment for announcements. Um, Pastor Dave is out on study leave this week, which is why we have the blessing of Bill Sanders. We have Amy playing for us instead of directing, since Sammy is out with COVID. Um, I, I'm not always very good at knowing what needs announcing, so y'all are gonna have to help me here. Yes, Neil. I'd like to call everybody's attention to uh, new stuff up on the bulletin board for the Parker Task Force. Perfect. Uh, we have our annual Christmas families that they gave us the other day. Uh, we donate uh, gifts that are on their list, and uh, they gave us a two-week turnaround. Ooh. So we have a cutoff for our church December 5th, so we can then get them over to the Parker Task Force. All right. 
Neil, I'm going to summarize you really briefly. Um, we have our Parker Task Force Christmas families. We buy gifts for these families, um, and then we give those gifts to the Parker Task Force, and they distribute them for Christmas. We have a very quick turnaround this year. Um, we need all the gifts to be back here by December 5th. Um, so if you go into the North X, we have our bulletin board. Please look on that um, and sign up to s support one of these families by giving a Christmas gift. Did I catch all that, Neil? Summarized it? Excellent. Are there other announcements? Yes, Liz. Next Sunday after the service, we will be greening the church, and that's not in the bulletin, but it should have been. Um, <laughs> just got left out. That's fine. Uh, so if you can spare uh, some time, the more help we have, the less time it will take. Excellent. So um, I'll have step seven, bring everything down from the upper lot, so everything should be in reachable uh, shape for us. Awesome. Okay, we have another announcement. Uh, this year, we have the opportunity to purchase our uh, quinsettias uh, tax-free through the Denver Flower Warehouse, and so, on the table, there are some envelopes if you uh, care to order plants that is for uh, decorating our uh, church for Christmas Eve. Um, there's an order form there. If we run out of order forms, I can print more. <laughs> <laughs> so Liz has two Christmas-related announcements. Um, we are going to be greening the church next Sunday. As someone who helps every year, please stay. Please spend five minutes. It only takes a second to help put something up, um, and it makes it so I don't spend 30 minutes on a ladder trying to hang things. So please stay for a few extra minutes next Sunday after church and help green the church. Everything will already be down, thanks to the wonderful people of Step 7. Um, so we will be greening our church next Sunday the 26th, so please be here. And then also, um, we have the opportunity to purchase our beautiful poinsettias tax-free this year. Um, so in order to get that done, we need you guys to grab the envelopes in the back um, and let us know how many you'd like um, and put the money inside so that we can actually purchase them. So uh, we had some interesting envelopes just show up without money last year. So please make sure you put your money in the envelope so that we can purchase the poinsettias. Are there other announcements? Another one, Neil, I'm all ears. I'd like to thank the congregation and those who contributed to the journey with migrants clothes mm -hmm. that were uh, collected. Uh, we took two vehicle loads of clothes down to their distribution point in Denver. And also, uh, there was quite a few uh, donations for the Parker Task Force for their Christmas, not Christmas, Thanksgiving uh, meals for their Excellent. handouts. Um, so two more big thank yous to all of you. Um, we support a group called Journey with Migrants, which helps migrants coming into Denver. We took two full carloads of clothing down to their drop point in Denver. Um, that helps clothe migrants who might be coming here with nothing. So thank you for being so generous. And also we had several donations to the Parker Task Force for Thanksgiving. You're helping make somebody's Thanksgiving special, and it might not be without you. So thank you to all of you. All right, please join me in prayer. God, you have so blessed us that we have this place that we can come together to make beautiful with our song and with our worship of you, God. We are so lucky to be here together and so grateful and blessed that you bring us together every Sunday and give us the opportunity to share these things that weigh on us, these things that feel like they're too heavy, God, that we can't carry them alone. And so not only do you help lift them, but God, you give us others that we can see that help lift the burdens from our hearts. God, we are also grateful that we can share the things that we're excited about and the things that are meaningful to us. We are grateful that you give us the opportunity to share them with each other. And God, we pray for those who might not be having the best Thanksgiving this next week, who are struggling with emotional, financial, family difficulties that might prevent them from not being able to have the thanksgiving that we all think of. And God, we pray that you would touch those lives and that you would help them to know that you are with them, even in these difficult times. And God, we pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray in this way. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Hey kids, how many of you have a special talent? Maybe it's one that you don't like to share with everyone because you're not sure who will appreciate it. For example, my uncle can burp the entire alphabet. Or maybe it's one you're excited about and enjoy sharing with others, like having a lovely singing voice and sharing it with your church by singing in the choir. Or maybe it's a talent you haven't even discovered yet. There are artists in the world who didn't discover their talent until they were aging adults, like Grandma Moses, who didn't start painting until she was 78 years old. All of us have some special talent, whether it's one we share with others often, one we only share sometimes, or one we haven't even discovered yet. My special talent is putting people at ease. People often tell me how comfortable they feel around me and how easy it is to talk to me. However, this was not always my special talent. As a child, I was annoying. When I was a kid, I talked through, around, and over everybody else's conversations. I hugged so hard that I was informed I cracked ribs, although I hope I never actually did that. And I couldn't keep my thoughts to myself to save my life. As I've gotten older, I've seen the value in listening to others, figuring out what makes them comfortable, and working to be a person that people enjoy talking to. My not exactly talents from childhood have been shaped by the people around me and by myself. I was given a talent and have worked to improve it over the years. The story about my talents relates to our Bible story today from Matthew chapter 25. This story tells how a master gave each of his servants some gold to be responsible for while he went on a long journey. He gave one servant five gold pieces, another two gold pieces, and the last a single gold piece. Then he went away on his journey. The servant with five gold pieces, the servants with five gold pieces and two gold pieces went out and used their money to make even more money, so that the one who had five pieces was le- came away with ten, and the one with two pieces came away with four in a field for safety. The servant with only one piece was afraid of losing the money, and so he went and he buried it in a field for safekeeping. When the master came home, the servants each brought him back the gold he had given them. The servants who had been given five and two gold pieces proudly showed their master how they had earned even more. Their master told them how proud he was of them and how he would elevate them in his household due to their good stewardship of his funds. The servant who had been given only one gold piece explained to his master that he was fearful of his master's wrath if that piece was lost, and so he had buried it in the field for safekeeping. The master told this servant how disappointed he was in them that he had seen an ability in this servant to make more money, but that servant had been too afraid to even try. This story reminds us that we are given talents by God, and instead of hiding them or being too afraid to use them, we should share them with others. My uncle's ability to burp the alphabet could be the beginning of a conversation with someone who needs to hear how much God loves them, but if he didn't try burping it, he would never know. Will you pray with me? Loving God, thank you for our many talents. Help us to see ourselves and others through your eyes and realize that you have given each of us talents that you want us to use. God, help us to know that using our talents can help others, whether we realize it or not. God, give us the courage to use our talents every day to your glory. In your name we pray, amen. This is the time in our service when my kiddos can come upstairs with me for godly play. Our poem today is Landscapes of the Heart by Kathy Cummings Chisholm. And uh, it's so in tune with our picture today, Unfamiliar Paths. But uh, Kathy Chisholm is a Presbyterian minister. And um, the Landscapes of the Heart uh, is a book that uh, provides photography, poems, and um, uh, stories that she found uh, God everywhere. 
and she just wants to praise him about it. Tracks in the snow testify to a well-traveled road, but I've never been this way before. I don't know what lies ahead. Whatever is just beyond the bend remains sheltered from sight, concealed by an archway of bare branches. To continue down an unfamiliar path could be risky, perhaps even foolish, or just maybe a wonderful adventure. But isn't this how we live each day? The future always just around the curve, a mystery to the present. Our prayer for illumination. Father God, open our hearts, minds, and minds so that we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. The Old Testament reading is Psalms 90. And when I think about the Psalms, I think about David. But uh, I've learned that he didn't write all of them, most of them, but not all of them. And uh, this one is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, Turn back, you mortals, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away, and they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and it is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are consumed by your anger, by your wrath we are overwhelmed. You have set our iniquities before you and our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days pass away under your wrath our years come to an end like a sigh, and the days of our life are 70 years, or perhaps 80, if we are strong. Even then, their span is only toil and trouble, and they are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger? Your wrath is as great as the fear that is due to you. So teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. Turn, O oh Lord, how long? Have compassions on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love so that we may, be, may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us, and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord, our God, be upon us and prosper us the work of our hands. Oh, prosper the work of our hands. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Dee. Um, I'm tempted to not read the next scripture because it was summarized so well by Cassie. <coughs> um, it's from the 25th chapter of Matthew. You may be familiar with the 25th chapter, which is famous for many of us for feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and visiting the prisoners. That comes later in the chapter. 
The parable that is our focus today in our lectionary and our worship is verses 14 through 30. And it is also a chapter which focuses a lot on uh, judgment. And so as Jesus talks the disciples through this parable, the man goes on a journey, he leaves his money, some of his money with his servants or his slaves, uh, five talents to one, three to another, one to another. Um, and when he went away, they either invested or hid that money. And when he came back, uh, he was pleased that the man with five talents had doubled it and the man with three talents had done okay. And the one man, the one servant who had buried his talents, Jesus condemned. And at the end of this passage, he says, uh, take his talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for the worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God. Thanks be to God. I know it's hard to say thanks when you just heard about condemnation. Um, but it's part of the scripture. It's part of... Uh, God's story, and even though we believe in a God of love, um, there is also judgment. And this morning, as uh, you celebrate your stewardship contributions for next year, this seems an appropriate, well, in fact, probably most of you have heard a stewardship sermon from this text sometime in your life in church. But let's go back to the psalm for a minute. Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, the psalmist cries, before even you had formed the earth and the world, from the everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. The psalmists, those who wrote those psalms, David and others, uh, always give us a good context for our world and our lives in juxtaposition with, with God and with creation. In time, reminding us of God who is the creator, sustainer, and holder of history and beyond history. God who is holder of time and the future also who looks towards eternity, but also the places in between. And so the psalmist prays for us and with us. Be with us now, God. Teach us your wisdom. Keep us focused on your providence and presence in our lives. Both as a community of faith and in our personal relationship to God and others, we offer this prayer. In simple terms, God, remind us that you are in charge, and we are not. Now, God is the Lord and King over all, the psalmist proclaims over and over. And Jesus never fails to lift up God as King, as Father, as Lord over all. And in fact, he teaches over and over about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. In fact, in this chapter, Matthew 25, Jesus begins by saying, then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. And then he tells his disciples three parables. The first follows the apocryphal theme of Matthew 24, which Jesus has been talking about the end times and involved foolish bridesmaids who were unprepared. And the third parable, which is familiar to most of us, is the parable of the goats and the sheep. The familiar parable of caring for the sick, the hungry, and the imprisoned. And Jesus tells them that if you do not do this, you do not do it to me. Now this chapter, Matthew 25, is the foundational parable for the Presbyterian Church 
USA's Matthew 25 project in which the denomination seeks to invite middle judicatories like presbyteries and congregations to participate in study and action. The challenge is introduced on the PCUSA's website with this statement. In your congregation, how can you be good stewards of the gifts of God as you await Christ's return? sharing in the Matthew 25 vision of eradicating systemic poverty, dismantling structural racism, and building congregational vitality. Wow. Three very relevant issues for our day. Systemic poverty, structural racism, and congregational vitality. I believe there is much wisdom in trying in trying to understand congregational vitality in relation to social justice. It's long been a biblical and historical call of concern of God's people to be caring for others. Now, in a society that is torn with disagreement, you may not have that in your community, <clears throat> but in a society and a nation and a world that is torn with threats from disagreements on how to balance justice and social reform and to how to divide from without and within the church and who's right and who's wrong, uh, perhaps this parable today might provide some insight. The lesson is often called the parable of the talents. And as I already mentioned, you've probably heard it before preached in a stewardship sermon. It's a great sermon for thinking about what we have and what we offer, what we are able to include as we participate in Christ's church. It's often tied to, well, just like part of the parable says, to productiveness and profit. And in the United States of America, those are things we grasp onto heartily in how we judge and how we determine a person or a corporation or a church's well-being or wealth. It's often held up as a model for this proof that Jesus blesses hard work and thoughtful investment. After all, those in the parable were rewarded, right? Now, I'm going to suggest that we think about this in another way this morning. In fact, there is a version of the story called The Fourth Talent, which is shared by William White. And it goes like this. Once there was a businessman who entrusted his property to his employees. To one servant, he gave $5,000, to a second, $2,000, and to a third, $1,000. And the first two invested the money and returned 200 cents on the dollar, while the third employee buried the money in the earth. On the day of accounting, he returned the original money to the master and was soundly chastised for failing to invest wisely. Now, there was a fourth employee who was given $3,000 to invest. He returned several days after the accounting took place and approached the master or the boss cautiously. I invested the money that you left with me, he confessed. But the investment turned sour. Not only has your money gained no interest, I have lost nearly $1,000 of the amount you entrusted to me. The businessman, the boss, smiled at his worried employee. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have invested as you were commanded. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Now, I realize that playing with Jesus' parables to fit our own situation might be a little dangerous. But in the context in which we live, I believe this is revelatory. Because if this parable is really about using the gifts that we have to profit or to gain, how does that speak to our own lives of discipleship? 
and also for our community discernment and desire to build up the kingdom of heaven, the church of Jesus Christ. I believe that this fourth talent story and the parable has one important message we often ignore. It's a message about fear. The one servant or employee you see that buried the talent out of fear of losing it is the key to this. This newer version for me reminds me that it's not really about the talents being money and invested for profit. It's, it's about being faithful and, and taking risks for the kingdom. It's about our fear of investing what we have, not just wealth in monetary terms, but, but the wealth we have in community resources or the communal wealth of knowledge and wisdom that we possess, taking a risk. It's kind of like our poem this morning. To go down a road you've never traveled is a risk. Even if you know what's at the end or hope you know, it can always be a risk, especially if it's a snowy road and a mountain that's lonely. But it's a risk we take to get to our destination. Now, in thinking about this parable, the Reverend Jill Duffield says this. She says, perhaps the talents in this tale represent wisdom, seeing and understanding the presence and will of Jesus. Those who recognize the Messiah and follow will learn more about who God is and what God requires. Now, those who perceive rightly the character of God act accordingly and turn again, turn to in turn, gain wisdom. It is in the practice of faith that our faith deepens and grows. In turn, when we fail to exercise, it atrophies. It's diminished. A life of faith requires risk, taking risks for the sake of the gospel. It demands of us enough trust to let go of our talents, our gifts, our resources, to be used in service to the God who entrusted us with them in the first place. It is in our letting go that we find freedom and expand our faith. Such risk-taking grows from trust in the God who makes us stewards and cannot be undertaken when we are afraid. Fear engenders scarcity and self-protection, not generosity and creativity. Fear makes for a fight or flight, not welcome and investment. The epistle reading this week that we did not read is, reminds us anxious new believers that they have all the information they need to be unafraid, according to Paul. He reminds them that they are not destined for wrath, but rather salvation. Paul tells them who they are, children of light and day, those who remain awake and sober in eager expectation of the return of Christ. Like the servants entrusted with the talents in Matthew, those early Christians live, live lives of expectation, of faithful waiting. So can we wait or in our waiting those who do wait for disease to abate, for the political landscape to settle so that we can anticipate Christ's birth and Christ's return in peace and joy. As we wait, knowing God's kingdom is present in the Spirit at work, is that our trust? Can we trust the God who lifts up prophets and provides in the wilderness, the God who sends the Son not to condemn the world, but to save it? Will we use the talents given to us in ways that demonstrate the abundant love of God? We might begin by taking some small risks for Christ's sake right where we are with what we have being faithful in little as we experience God's goodness and become ever more faithful in much. 
in a climate awash in fear, demonstrating trust, it doesn't come easily. The temptation to bury our talents grows with, with each threat and each uncertainty. Those of us who follow Jesus Christ are called upon to encourage each other and build one another up so as to be able to take risks that faith requires. There's a church in our presbytery, a small church, struggling church, struggling because they have few members and they have a building that's aging and they struggle to figure out how to survive most weeks. And yet they have come up with amazing ways to supplement their income to care for their building and remain doing ministry. They rent out space to other congregations and to community groups. This church happens to sit on some property that they've owned for 50 years. And one meeting, they were talking about what they could do with what they have. And they decided they wanted to use part of their property to build low-income housing. And in putting together a plan, they worked for literally years with the city, with Habitat for Humanity, with the Presbytery, with the national denomination, to come up with grants and funds and to change zoning laws. They canvassed the neighborhood and talked to people who were in the neighborhood and convinced them it was a good idea. And as of a couple of weeks ago, they broke ground on that property and they have begun building some marvelous condominiums that will be low-income housing for people to be able to afford to own their own place and Habitat for Humanity is building those places. As people of faith, when we get to our chapter of God's salvation history, <clears throat> it is one sometimes that might be inhaled for such within and without. We are called for such a time as this to use the talents that God has given us in service to the kingdom and for the gospel's sake. Now, I believe, is not the time to hunker down in fear, to hoard our gifts and hope that we can hide until the storms pass. We are to step into the breach, to be repairers of it. This means we must take risks, act prayerfully in faith, and trust the one who calls and equips us and go for broke with our talents. You see, being timid will not change our reality, and neither will being fearful. Being faithful, taking risks for the sake of Jesus, trusting God to use whatever gifts we offer, and betting it all on the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit just might. Why don't we go for broke and find out? You see, if we are afraid of failure, if we bury our talents, our gifts, we might never experience the blessings and joy of watching what God is able to do with us, among us, even in spite of us. To be faithful is to invest, to spend, to use the gifts that God has given and trust the results to God. May it be so in Christ's name. Amen. This morning, I understand, is your Stewardship Dedication Sunday. And so there is a basket on the communion table. And as we sing this next hymn, if you have not already brought your pledge card up, and you are welcome and encouraged to do so, to place it in the basket. And I'm pretty sure if you forgot to bring it today, the church will still accept it later. But uh, contemplate, ponder what gifts you have and what gifts this congregation has as we sing our next song, God Whose Giving Knows No Ending. Nope, I'm way ahead of myself. Time out. Sorry. Wrong page. 
Whatever the next song is, that's what we're going to sing. <laughs> oh, I know what I did. <laughs> Are you with me? Are you as lost as I am? Exactly. Stand and sing if you're able. regulars know that the offering plate is in the back as you go out and you may put your offerings um, and if you have a pledge sheet that you still want to fill out you are welcome and we give God thanks for the gifts that we have and what you offer so let us pray this morning we give you thanks God and gratitude on this Sunday before Thanksgiving especially we are thankful for family and friends for your beautiful creation for this place and space to worship for this community of faith and as we give thanks we thank you for the gifts and talents that are here some hidden some evident in the gifts of the people of God here at Providence as we bring our stewardship pledges for next year, we pray that they might be sustaining for this congregation and might be a powerful witness to the community of your grace and your love and your church. And as we offer our gifts today, may they also be blessed that they might too be gifts, a sign of your love for a world that needs love so desperately. As we give our gifts, we pray that you also will fill our hearts with compassion and with peace in a time when there seems to be no peace. And that in all things we might remember that we are loved thoroughly and wholly by you and that we will use our gifts and our lives to share your love with others in Christ we pray. Amen. Now as you go, may the grace of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, the Holy Spirit keep you, that you may live in peace, abound in hope, 
and grow in love this day and always. Amen.